and poverty. So, the global macro environment is one of very weak trade growth. Hmm? We have seen in the past uh, seven years in particular, but in the past decade, a rise in the most ridiculous policies of protectionism, of trade wars, of lack of cooperation between countries, of division. We are in a moment of, me of a very significant division in the world economy. And that is bad for growth and is bad for the world in general. In that environment, hmm, India has continued to grow its exports and has continued to grow its level of cooperation with the world, showing again a completely different trend to other economies that are actually closing down. And closing down means much worse, not just economic growth, but actually huge bursts of economic bubbles. We have also seen a process of commodity disinflation. Right now, the uh, environment of commodities is an environment that is significantly less inflationary than the ones that we have seen in the past couple of years. And that is a good thing. And that is a good thing that comes fundamentally from the process of rate hikes. Lower commodity prices in dollar terms are positive for a very simple reason. It makes energy more affordable, it makes uh, businesses more competitive, and it makes growth more attractive in m many of the economies. For a country like India that is putting that monumental level of growth with a high level of imports of energy from abroad, those are factors that work very positively because they accelerate the transition to more uh, efficient, cleaner energies with more independence as we have seen from some of the presentations today, but also because it accelerates the competitiveness of the industry as we have seen as well. India right now in the world presents a number of opportunities and has obviously a number of challenges. In this conference we have seen some of the most amazing stories business-wise. We have seen companies with five, seven decades of experience and we have seen companies that are driving transformation in the business world with a process that is on the one hand value creating and at the same time it is hugely expansionary. India is offering mm, uh, products to the world and services to the world that are more competitive and that are also more added value. And that is one of the most important factors. The first opportunity, demographics. Demographics. It's not just population growth and the youth that create, that keep a nation in development and rising fast. Is that demographics are also the tool for innovation, are also a tool for knowledge, a tool for discovery, a tool to implement better and more productive ways of doing things globally. The demographic aspect of India separates massively the economy from that of the euro area uh, in which obviously the demographic element is not working but uh, and certainly most of the developed nations. The business outlook today as we speak and as we will see in this presentation the business outlook both in perception of business opportunities as well as the business outlook in terms of access to capital, in entrepreneurial uh, in, uh, spirit, very important, very important entrepreneurial spirit because one of the key elements of the growth of India and one of the key elements that it differentiates it from other less 
growing economies is the incredible fabric of credit to micro companies and the incredible fabric of credits to the uh, small and medium enterprises. This is a huge transformation that should be uh, exported to the rest of the world and is not even close to that. In one of the presentations prior, one of the uh, one of the messages that I heard was that the banks were giving as much level of importance to a $1 million or a $10 million loan than to a $10 loan. Technology. Technology is absolutely, absolutely critical. The level of access to businesses and services that technology is providing us is making such an advancement for India that the access to healthcare, the access to information from government services, the access to all of the things that actually improve the quality of life, all of those are accelerating, not at an exponential level, but at a monumental level. Though those are important factors, all those are very important factors, but we don't see them on a day-to-day -day basis the way that we probably should because we are gathering a stronger element of growth for the economy. But furthermore, there is a very important factor, is that unlike in many of those economies that I just mentioned that are not growing at all or growing significantly less in the middle of very large expansion plans, in the middle of very large government plans, is that fiscal prudence is a critical factor that is also supporting the Indian economy. And we will talk about that in more detail afterwards. What are the challenges? We live in a world in which we are seeing too much reliance in the Euro area, in the United States, in so many economies, too, too much reliance on monetary policy decisions. We are seeing in many economies how the currency is being destroyed by incorrect monetary policies. One of the positive things that the Indian economy has is that it's reducing the fiscal balance and it's reducing the trade balance. Therefore, those two things make it less dependent on US dollars from abroad. However, it is also important to keep that process improving in order to maintain the purchasing power of the Indian rupee, maintain the purchasing power of salaries and deposit savings. The second challenge is taxation. Hmm? There is a huge requirement of infrastructure, as we have discussed in this summit. There is a huge requirement of a number of programs that will be developed in the next years by the government. It's important to balance the important drivers that the government is supporting by helping businesses, by helping families, by providing the infrastructure that the economy requires with a level of taxation that continues to be attractive for innovation, for attraction of capital, and to deliver the type of value-added investment growth that the Indian economy requires. Taxation is a very challenging process because obviously uh, taxes and revenues are always cyclical. They depend on the economic cycle and expenditures tend to be annualized and continued. Hmm? So governments in that process tend, need to pay attention to the first and foremost process in order to keep tax revenues rising and tax revenues at a level that is sufficient to keep the balance in the budget. And that is growth. And that is growth. There is no better taxation policy than 
growth oriented taxation policies and that is exactly that that process in which you have fair taxation while at the same time attractive for businesses to bring capital to india are absolutely crucial sometimes in the economic world we hear one too many times that rising taxes is the process in order to create higher revenues no raising taxes is not the process to create higher revenues the process to create better and more sustainable revenues is a competitive attractive and growth oriented taxation the speed of moral change is another important challenge why we just heard it in a number of our presentations today we're talking about not a transformation not a growth transformation not an exponential transformation transformation but a monumental transformation of the indian economy so the speed of change needs to include a number of elements that don't affect growth so it is very important to continue as we are as we will discuss in a few moments continue investing in improving sustainability improving the uh, access to clean energy to clean water infrastructure etc with growth ie not destroy the sources of growth because of a misguided decision that for example we have seen in the euro area no what we need to do therefore in india is to always keep in mind that a transformational process is a gradual process and that gradual processes cannot be at the expense of growth because it would be at the expense of poverty reduction india today is the highest growth of all of the large uh, uh, all of the large economies by far by far mm -hmm. and we have discussed in the summit throughout this day a number of important things which is usually are all put together under the gdp umbrella no 6.5 whether well, it is going to be 6.5 is it going to be 6.8 is it going to to be 7 the key to me is what is the trend and what is the sustainable trend of gdp growth of the indian economy the sustainable trend of gdp growth of the indian economy is not 5% is not 6% it's actually significantly higher hmm? and therefore the, we cannot think that the economy right now is in a process in which maybe uh, it's a surprising level of growth there is a tremendous level of opportunity that delivers more opportunities to strengthen and increase that growth think about this for a second when you look at the world economy hmm, what do you see in the united states what do you see in the euro area what do you see in china what do you see in many of the developing economies what do you see in most of asia is a manufacturing sector that is in contraction that is not the case in india hmm? the manufacturing sector and it's been said very very well in one of the occasions in the summit the manufacturing sector has exponential opportunities of growth in india because all of the parts of the chain can grow as some of the companies that have talked today has shown by 15 20 double their sales every year hmm? is the thing to understand is that the economic model of india is not subject to the requirements of the economic decisions of the indian economy alone is that the economic model of india is the growth of the world multiplied by 3 and that shows that that consensus gdp for 2024 is perfectly feasible 
is perfectly feasible. India can increase growth by another 1% by pushing further into investment and pushing further into all of those added value sectors that can bring the economy and bring all of those companies that we see that are exporting but some, some of them could triple, multiply by four, multiply by five their exports. So there's a tremendous level of uh, growth there. Second, there is a tremendous level of growth in services. In services. We talk a lot about manufacturing and industry because they're key to development. But services are not just able to improve very quickly is that they are able to multiply not by two not by three but multiply somebody said this morning in a, a talking about investment multiply by a hundred think about this the average size of a business in India is very small multiply it by a hundred would bring many of those micro companies to be small enterprises and that's multiplying by a hundred. See the sheer size of the business fabric of this country is not just so vast in terms of uh, micro companies but also so vast in the small and medium enterprise in the medium and in the large enterprises that all of them combined can go and multiply not just by 10, 20 times in the case of small and medium enterprises, but by 100, 150, 200 in the case of micro enterprises, the moment that they start reaching out, instead of looking inward, looking outward, looking to the other regions, looking to other, uh, and using technology to access those customers globally that are uh, able to support that level of, of growth. So, we talked about manufacturing briefly, but let's go in detail to the latest PMIs, Purchasing Manager Index, which are the forward-looking indices that we uh, analyze as economists. They're very good surveys that tend to tell us a little bit about how the economy is performing. Okay, the India services sector, let's think about this for a second. The Euro Area Services PMI, Purchase and Managers Index, hmm, is in contraction. Is in contraction. The uh, Chinese and uh, the uh, services PMI is also weakening. And the Indian service economy continues to register impressive growth hmm, despite the slowdown of the world activity and despite a uh, slightly lower level of intakes. But this is a key factor. Export is an absolutely key part of the improvement in the services sector. So it's not just new business gains, but that the Indian economy is showing an impressive level of growth. In an Im this is the key that you need to understand. An impressive level of growth in a global economy that is not slowing down now, that was slowing down last year as well. Manufacturing. Manufacturing is not just bucking the trend of the rest of the world. It's just breaking all records because it's not just at a very substantial level of growth, but the key thing here is that the manufacturing sector continues to be in huge expansion and improving in an environment of deceleration of the rest of the world. And I think I, I, you probably are thinking, Mr. Lacay is repeating this a, a number of times. And I think it's very important because every time that I come to India, there is this sort of feeling that India does well when the world economy is doing well. And that is obviously true. We're all interconnected. But India is doing well in 2023 and is expected to do very well in 2024 when the rest of the world is not doing very well. And this is, to me, a very important differentiating factor. Just to give you an example, 
Mexico used to be tied almost one to one with the growth of the United States. It stopped being tied up to the growth of the United States and Mexico is in stagnation when the United States is still growing. Not a lot, but it's still growing. Hmm? In the case of India, uh, we have seen that change hmm, that we had not experienced since the early 90s and it's driven by all of those different factors that I mentioned and that I will go into detail. When we think about the economy, there is unfortunately, globally, a trend of people that are looking at the economy upside down. It is so refreshing to hear from so many of the people that have spoken today, to hear from experts, from ministers, from investors, from academics, to hear that investment, saving, attraction of capital are the key drivers of growth, because it's true. But, but unfortunately, globally, we hear too many people thinking that debt and money printing are the drivers of growth, and obviously they are not. If debt and money printing were the drivers of growth, Argentina and Venezuela would be the fastest growing countries in the world and not the disasters that they are. The business outlook for India is so important to understand whether the level of growth that we are talking about is sustainable because it is showing not just that the perception of investors, the perception of entrepreneurs, the perception of uh, job creators is positive, but that it is not just driven by opportunities of growth, but by opportunities of innovation and added value. This is the key. And this is the key. Because we are looking at an economy that has spent already a number of years growing faster without having to compete only in terms of price and only in terms of being cheaper than another. Hmm? The big difference of growth between China and India in this, in this process that we have seen since 2020 is that one has been driven by a huge real estate and construction problem that is now uh, not, not working in the case of China and the other by an improvement in the business outlook. Think about this. Hmm? The level of economic growth that businesses are showing is so phenomenal hmm, that despite the protectionist measures from other countries, despite the changes in uh, laws and trade barriers. Despite all of the global challenges in the geopolitical area, hmm, the business outlook in India has not gone slower, but it's ha accelerated. Technology is a key part of that. We have discussed it. Manufacturing is a key part of that. Infrastructure, it's all interconnected. It's not one or another. Everything is interconnected is that somebody mentioned before in the coffee break, I believe, that this was a Goldilocks moment for India. But Goldilocks sounds like something that just happened out of a fairy tale or because it came from the sky. No, it's a combination of a lot of policies that have been moving towards one goal, which is growth and sustainable growth. That is what it's driving that part. And this is a very important uh, element because in this chart by Ned Davis, what we see is that the India business outlook is not just improving. In some countries it's improving. In some Asian countries it is improving. No, it is at all-time highs. Hmm? Now, one can think if it is at all-time high, maybe there is way too much optimism. Well, I don't think 
that the business fabric and the entrepreneurial fabric of India is one of uh, overly optimistic and crazy uh, investors and crazy entrepreneurs. What I hear all the time is a lot of prudence, a lot of uh, policies and actions that are very, very uh, well oriented towards not taking massive levels of risk. This is not an overly geared economy in which businesses are taking too much risk in one single sector or the level of indebtedness has gone through the roof. It's rather the opposite. It's rather the opposite. When you look at the business fabric in India, the average debt to equity of the uh, small and medium enterprises is very, very low. But the average debt to equity of the large companies is also very low. So it's not, so this business outlook is not driven by bubbles. This is the point, no? The world is in a massive slowdown. And the reason why the world is in a massive slowdown is not because the world uh, cannot grow faster. And it's not because the world is in, uh, d in a difficult shape. It's because the world has grown too used to using the credit card. Huh? The world is too indebted and thinks that taking too much debt is going to be solved by taking even more debt. Hmm? Doesn't work. Anybody here from any of these families knows that that is not the way to do it. But the problem of the world is simply that. The problem of the world is that government deficit in the United States is 1.7 trillion dollars and the US government thinks that it's an improvement because it's not two trillion dollars. No? The problem in the Euro area is that European Union com countries compare themselves with each other. So when you compare yourself with somebody that is not doing very well, what tends to happen is that you think that you are doing okay when you're not doing very well either. Hmm? I just heard in the, in the summit that the Indian economy has surpassed the French GDP and that it may surpass the GDP of Germany and Japan. And the question is not, is not whether it will surpass the GDP of Germany and Japan. The question is only when, not, not if. It is going to happen. It is going to happen because the world has forgotten where growth comes. The world thinks that growth comes from government spending with debt and from printing money. And that is not where growth comes. Where, where growth comes is from investment, prudent savings and a government that facilitates that level of investment and prudent savings. And that's why the question is not where is not if the Indian economy is going to surpass the German. The question is when? Why? Because Germany today is in a recession in the middle of a massive stimulus plan called the Next Generation EU Fund. Germany is in a recession in the middle of cheap oil prices and cheap natural gas prices which are good for them in terms of, of, of imports and Germany is in a recession in the middle of a central bank that, is, that has implemented for years negative interest rates. Negative interest rates are the destruction of money and when you destroy money the outcome is always recession. So India is the engine of growth and if you look at this chart hmm, what you see is that India and China, hmm, two of the engines of growth, see the divergence. Hmm? They used to be one-to-one. -one. 
They used to be one to one for years, almost, relative to the world in terms of the purchase and managers index. And see the divergence suddenly, not suddenly, eh? but since 2019, hmm, the divergence is phenomenal. India's difference relative to China is unstoppable. And it's unstoppable because India's economy is opening while the Chinese economy, and I'm really sorry to say it because I love China, is closing. And when you, clo and when you open an economy, the opportunities are endless. When you close an economy, problems start to appear. All, all of the sectors are outperforming in the case of India. And there's also a benefit but it's not a zero-sum game. A lot of people, as an economist, tell me that the reshoring effect is something that is going to benefit India at the expense of China. No, this is completely ridiculous. No, there is no such thing as the concept of reshoring. There is the concept of investing where there are opportunities. And, P and investments are accumulative and exponential are, and growing. So nobody is taking growth from anybody. India is not taking any growth from China. China is going to grow 4%. India is not taking any business from China. India is attracting new business that comes from all of the opportunities globally that are appearing. This is a very important part. Fund flows. Fund flows are absolutely critical. This is, we will see later, hmm? this is something that we should understand right now. Today, Latin America should have been, an should have been in an environment of massive reception of capital from the world. Hmm? However, Latin America is weakening and is growing much slower than what it should grow in a period like this. And the reason is because it's not creating, many of the countries are not creating the opportunities to invest that they should. Again, India is not taking investment from Latin America. India is simply providing and facilitating an environment for business creation. Nothing more and nothing less. It looks so simple. It looks so simple. Yet, the world has forgotten and has wanted to forget at some point that investment is not something that you are uh, uh, awarded because you are the king. Investment is something that you have to attract. Mm -hmm. So, the general strength relative to a weak Europe, to a weak uh, the United States, is growing faster than Europe, but, I, but the United States needs one unit of debt for every unit of GDP. So it's, it's not in a massively positive position. And one of the things that we need to understand as well is, okay, all of these things we have discussed in this conference today. All of these things we have discussed them. But what about the future? What, does, what do the leading indicators show us about India relative to the world? And it's pretty amazing to be fairly honest because when you look at a leading indicator that basically shows that the United States, the OECD, okay, fair enough, they're more or less in a slow down but not crisis environment. This is important. We are moving to a slowdown, but not doesn't look like a crisis. The India economy, in leading indicators, the ones that tell us about 2025 and 2026, not 2024, 2025, 2026, okay, in leading indicators is accelerating. And that is actually also a very, very positive signal. Uh, and, a, and a very interesting thing here, is, I come back to the point, is that India is not, is, this is not a zero-sum game. It's not taking from others. Hmm? The rest of the uh, Asian economy in general is showing a leading indicator that is also in growth mode. But, but India has accelerated much faster. 
I mentioned fund flows. I mentioned fund flows because they are critical. And economists usually don't pay attention to this. It's where is the money going? Everybody has seen the movie Jerry Maguire. Huh? Show me the money. Now, where is the money going? Where is the money going? Now, this chart here is phenomenal because it's showing that fund flows into India are not just growing, but they're growing in an environment in which those fund flows are either negative or declining in most of the economies that are comparable. That is a very good thing. Because that is, those fund flows are investing in the economy that will be 2025, 2026, 2027. Hmm? It's also very important to understand that the in institutional investor positioning in terms of India in private equity, in uh, business development, in innovation, in technology is growing in an environment of economic slowdown. So that is also something that will cement the pillars of the level of growth of the future. Hmm? Now, all of this sounds nice, but I mentioned the most important challenge that every government needs to pay attention to, which is the currency. The currency is the most important driver of risk or uh, opportunity. Why? Because the currency literally is like the business card of a country. Without a solid currency, weaknesses start to appear because investment starts to be less driven by uh, long-term decisions and more short-term, where uh, weak currency is always a negative. Very important driver of reduction in risk for the Indian currency is the current account stabilization. Hmm? This is absolutely critical. Absolutely critical. We have heard throughout the day about the improvements in imports, the efficiency improvements, the reduction in some of the most expensive imports that the Indian economy requires, the ex going from importer to exporter in many of the sectors. That is a key driver of what is going to drive more inflows of hard currency into the Indian economy. Hmm? A prudent monetary policy is also very important. Money supply growth, obviously in an economy that grows 7%, money supply growth needs to be ample. You don't want to create a financial crisis in an economy that requires credit from the smallest enterprise to the largest. But that doesn't mean that money supply growth needs to overshadow the use of that money supply, which is prudent investment and capital expenditure for industries and for services. So, the India current account is improving and it's improving dramatically. If you look at it from history, it's not just improving dramatically, is that we have not seen that kind of improvement in a world that was slowing down in, uh, in previous decades. So those are important, important factors to the most important thing. Now, what we need to, what are we worried? What is every single family in this, in this place today worried about? Inflation. Yeah? Inflation is taxation without legislation, Milton Friedman used to say. Inflation is a huge negative for any economy because inflation is like fever. When we have an illness, we go to the hospital and the doctor, the first thing that tries to do is to reduce the fever. Not because we are ill of fever, but because inflation, like fever, you need to bring them down quickly in order to stabilize the rest of the body and to improve the, uh, the situation of the patient. Well. In this chart, what we see is that a number of factors are at least extremely positive for the Indian economy in terms of uh, 
in terms of the CPI, the Consumer Price Index reduction. If we look at the month-on-month -month decline of, the, of CPI, it is coinciding with a period of massive increase in services, massive increase in manufacturing, and huge GDP growth. So declining inflation with GDP growth is very positive, hmm? is really, really positive. The other thing that is very important is to see the components. No? It's very important to see, for example, that the imported price is uh, imported prices are also slowing down significantly without compromising the level of absolute imports. Eh? So inflation is coming down and it needs to be kept under control in order to stabilize and maintain the purchasing power of salaries and the purchasing power of deposit savings. Deposit savings, by the way, that as we mentioned at the beginning this, mo this morning, are the vast majority of the savings of citizens. No? Mm -hmm. So, in inflation, the most important thing that the government can control is to put all of its efforts in controlling those that are non-replaceable goods and services. Hmm? CPI inflation is important, but what's most important are those prices that we, of the things that we purchase every day. Hmm? Inflation reduction is an absolute key for social mobility. In order to improve the reduction, continue to reduce poverty, and continue to improve social mobility, reducing inflation is an absolute must. In the case of food and beverages, as you can see, the decline is also very important and needs to continue to be that way. But think about this. The kind of economy that India can be with decline in inflation and rising GDP is very substantial, but declining inflation with declining poverty is increasing wealth of the economy, is making people richer, is making the poorer richer, and that is something that is exceedingly important in order to maintain a healthy and sustainable economy. Look. Sustainability is extremely important, but many times when we talk about sustainability, we forget what is completely unsustainable. Mm? There is nothing more unsustainable than losses, because mm? losses are always paid by somebody else. Eh? So the economy can improve in sustainability but not reach sustainability through loss making or enormous challenges for the public finances. As such, it is very important, exceedingly important in order to have a sustainable economy for India to have a prudent monetary policy. A prudent monetary policy that is aimed at supporting growth that is aimed at supporting credit that at the same time provides some relief to the are taking uh, some debt in the next uh, years and and it's very important the most important thing that the central bank needs to pay attention to is the level of reserves the only central bank in the world that pays attention to the, global, uh, to the global demand for the local currency is the Federal Reserve. And if we pay attention to the global demand for the, uh, for the local currency, that is an absolutely critical way of improving the situation in the forthcoming years. So prudent monetary policy with prudent interest rates. Interest rates shouldn't be too low because when they are too low they create what? Bubbles. No? Interest rates shouldn't be too high because when they are too high they create credit problems. And it's difficult to decide eh, because the opinions are different. No? So it's always a question of testing this, the, 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 the situation. Right now I think 
that it's very likely that in 2024 the Central Bank of India will implement at least three rate cuts. But obviously that depends on the outlook for inflation and that obviously depends also in the situation of the economy. With a 6.8% grown economy, there is no need for rate cuts. Let's be fairly honest. So obviously let's, that is something that we all need to pay attention to. The other thing that we need to have is a balance of liquidity injections and preserving the purchasing power of the currency. So it's essential, as I mentioned before, the best way to reduce poverty is to keep the purchasing power of salaries uh, uh, in, in a stable position at the same time as you grow the economy. And that also attracts long-term investment. Inflation has another problem. Inflation tends to attract very short-term investment. Logical, no? If you have inflation, you, if you have inflation, you want to put some money, get some money quickly, and get out of there before there is a destruction of the purchasing power of the currency. No? When there is stable inflation and low inflation, investments are more long-term, and that is always good for, for the economy. So, we talk about sustainability. And when we talk about sustainability, we have to remember what I said before. There is nothing more unsustainable than losses. So the sustainability model of India cannot be driven by the ideas of Daniel Lacalle or of the European Union or of the United States. The sustainability path of India has to be chosen by the Indian economy keeping in balance the pillars of growth, poverty reduction, uh, se uh, security of supply and improvement of the purchasing power of salaries. Those four pillars are absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. So the improvements in sustainability of the Indian economy are not just incredible, they are absolutely phenomenal, spectacular, and we should be applauding them from the perspective of the things that the minister told us in the previous session as well, is that there's also a massive need of infrastructures to increase mm, dramatically the number of flights, the number of people traveling, etc., etc., etc. So, if we look at the database of sustainability in the case of the Indian economy, what we see is that in all of the aspects that really matter, the Indian economy is reaching its targets of sustainability much faster than what many of the analysts expected. Think about this. We need to also put it in the context of a world in which other countries have missed their sustainability targets in that same period. No? So, the improvement in all of the social aspects is very impressive. It's not just very impressive, there's a lot that can continue to be done but it has to be done the way that we have seen throughout this summit. It has to be done by adding mm, prudent decisions in terms of model changes, prudent decisions in terms of changing the landscape in order to maintain security of supply. We all want cleaner energy, absolutely we do, but you know what we really want is to keep the lights on. So we, we need, those two objectives are not one against the other. Security of supply and sustainability are equally important objectives. Mm? And we cannot take one from the other. Mm? But we cannot forget, you know, I cannot come in a plane from Europe and say to India, oh, and you must 
Uh, stop doing this. No. Security of supply and sustainability are two parts of a competitive energy policy. Competitive energy policy is critical. There is no way in which the manufacturing, the services, and the, impover, uh, the, the poverty ratios, all of them improve as they are in India without a competitive energy policy. It needs cheap, affordable, and abundant energy. Those three things hmm, need to go hand in hand with technology but they cannot go above and beyond technology. We, in many cases, we don't have yet the technology to have enough uh, security of supply with some technologies. Well, that's why we have backup and why we have different base load energies that allow us to provide secure, efficient, affordable and competitive energy for industries. We cannot pass to businesses the cost of inefficiencies in technology. Technology, the reason why the uh, whale oil was substituted by crude oil was not because governments decided to take care of whales, but because crude oil was cheaper, easier to transport, more affordable and more competitive, period. Hmm? When, and it will happen, solar, wind, all of the different technologies that we are building that are fantastic, and all of them at the same time added to nuclear, added to, the, to natural gas, which is critical to the, an improvement in sustainability, all of those factors have to be put together in a competitive energy policy that doesn't harm growth and reduction of poverty. So, what we have in front of us is a monumental task. Hmm? The world has a monumental task, but that monumental task is not something that we can on the one hand either think that we are defeated or on the other hand think that it doesn't have a solution. Of course it has a solution and it's called technology. Huh? If I look at all the lights that we have here, uh, we are probably spending a lot less, we are consuming a lot less energy than what maybe two rooms consumed a few decades ago. Hmm? So efficiency, technology and competitiveness are the drivers of sustainability. And those are the factors that we need to uh, help. The government is doing incredible things in uh, giving support to small and, uh, and micro companies in order to implement technology and efficiency and energy saving programs. It's incredible and they need to be put into, into effect and those will continue to drive those sustainability factors further. But at the same time, we need to feed people and we need to give them clean water and we need to give them access to, uh, to education and to health care. And that requires strong investments, strong energy consumption and high levels of, of growth. All of that can be achieved. The, the fact is that, and this is the IEA that doesn't tend to be extremely, uh, let's say, optimistic about things, the IEA says that India has overreached its commitment made at COP21 and that is already meeting 40% of its power capacity uh, targets. All of these are incredible achievements that you should be taken into account. Taken into account the fact as well that we are in the process of uh, generating that monumental transformation of an economy that has the most incredible potential of the world. Also, investment in renewable energy has risen dramatically in India. However, it is still 
a lot to go. This is the great, by the way, this is the great thing that I always have when I look at the Indian economy, is that I see things that can grow 100%, 130%, and there's still potential to double, to triple. This is the key thing, no? So the key thing here is that we have an incredible task ahead. There is more than $2 trillion required of investments in infrastructure and in technology in India in order to continue to strengthen its sustainability position. One, those, those, uh, those incredible capital requirements will come from the private sector which is looking for growth, which is looking for sustainability and is also looking for opportunities of added value. The other thing is that if we look at all of the financing needs, they're perfectly achievable. The great thing about these figures that look monumental from an IEA slide perspective is that they are perfectly achievable in an economy that is so vast and that has such a tremendous opportunity going forward. So, when we look at these things, we should not look at them from the perspective of it's going to be very difficult, but from the perspective of it's not just feasible, it's that it is feasible relative to other economies that are far behind in terms of achieving that level of sustainable growth. In fact, in terms of sustainability attraction, India continues to be the third economy in the world in terms of renewable energy country attractiveness, which is phenomenal, to be fairly honest, when I look at this chart. Because what, you know what you see in that chart as well? Is that other economies have been going down. Huh? Is, that the, is that India maintains a level of attractiveness that is unsurpassed relative to the growth opportunity because in number one and in number two the growth opportunity is not to multiply by four or multiply by five it may be a 10 15 percent increase per annum it's very very different so this is another factor that the government needs to maintain and the government needs to take into account and that the government needs to nurture needs to strengthen, needs to make, make uh, more attractive. Uh, what's the partnership opportunity? The partnership opportunity, I'll tell you what it is. Hmm? At the beginning of my conference, I said it, the euro area is in recession. But the euro area has a tremendous amount of capital from companies that are looking for growth opportunities. And those growth opportunities can come here. Hmm? The United States is growing, but it's not growing as much as in the past. And it's very difficult to achieve the levels of growth that it has seen in history. Therefore, U.S. companies are also looking at India as their uh, outlet for, to achieve sustainable growth with higher added value. Also, the rest of Asia, South Korea, Japan, those countries are also looking for opportunities and opportunities of growth of this magnitude are not able, are not easily able to find in other, in other economies. So, in summary, there is a distinct feature about the Indian economy that has been happening since 2020 and that has been strengthening, which is that it is getting stronger while competitors are getting weaker. And those are, that's an important factor. It, it does not need a 4% per annum world economy growth to grow by 6%. It will grow by 6, 6.2, 6.4% with a 2% growth economy. I.e., the Indian economy is growing much faster when the world is growing less than it did in 2008 in the middle of a, cri of a crisis. Monetary, monetary and fiscal challenges need to be monitored very, very prudently by the government. The needs of infrastructure investments, the need for social programs, the need for different elements of spending are to be met with a fiscal policy that is prudent and growth 
driven and at the same time and at the same time uh, maintaining at best the monetary policy that keeps the currency uh, and therefore real wages relatively stable hopefully improving because that is also a source of poverty reduction all of the sustainability goals are achievable there is nothing that the Indian economy is showing that is not achievable in this in this process however those sustainability goals must be intertwined with the growth and poverty reduction goals India cannot compromise growth and poverty reduction for simply headline grabbing decisions. Hmm? There are a lot of things that India is doing, those things are being done, technology is helping, efficiency is helping, competitiveness is helping and therefore the, the path of sustainability is not the issue for India. And finally, inflow of capital keep this spirit of remembering that the economy is driven by investment and prudent savings and not by debt and money printing keep the spirit because with the spirit India will continue to prove to the world that you can grow, you can grow faster, you can grow better, you can generate more added value, you can lift people out of poverty and you can achieve all those things while you take care of the environment and you make people richer without playing the tricks of magic cards because 2 plus 2 doesn't equal 22 but the Indian economy has a stronger path of growth ahead than what we have seen in many years and the opportunity is not just reached a record high but it's at the beginning of what could be a multi-year growth and investment phase thank you so much for your patience and your attention